How can the global aviation industry weather the coronavirus storm? Some airlines are hoping to resume summer flights and are facing more turbulence and may not survive. What does the airline industry need to recover from the pandemic? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. It's described as the biggest crisis in aviation history. With borders closed to limit the spread of coronavirus, airlines are forced to ground their fleets, costing them billions in lost revenue every single month. Some airlines are hoping to resume flights and restore links as countries begin to ease their lockdowns. But many places, such as the UK, are making it mandatory for travellers to spend two weeks in quarantine when they land. British Airways, EasyJet and Ryanair are challenging the government, ruling in court, saying it's irrational, ineffective and will cost thousands of tourism jobs. One, because it has no scientific basis for it at all. Two, it's not a quarantine because you allow people arriving at airports to go on to the London Underground transport. It's unimplementable because people, you'll be calling people on mobile phones and they can be on a golf course, a beach in the local supermarket uh, when they're not quarantining. But it is going to do devastating damage to inbound visitors coming to Britain during the peak of the uh, tourism season of July and August. Britain's government defended the policy as being the right thing to do. Most Brits understand that we've sacrificed a lot. We've stayed at home. We've you know, been fighting this virus, getting the R number below one. What we don't want to do is you know, end up... Um, sort of essentially re-importing it, either by people coming here or Brits going abroad and coming back. So I think the idea of a quarantine um, is the right thing to be doing, and I, I note that it has uh, broad public support. The International Air Transport Association has a bleak forecast. IATA says that 2020 will be the worst year in the history of aviation, with airlines set to lose $84 billion. That's $230 million every day. Africa's already struggling. Carriers are amongst the hardest hit. South African Airways, which hasn't made a profit in nine years, is being run by administrators. They're seeking one and a quarter billion dollar payout to repay debt and restore services. In Asia, Hong Kong's Cathay Pacific received a five billion dollar bailout from the government after suffering huge first quarter losses. Middle Eastern Airlines, Emirates, Etihad and Qatar Airways recently announced job losses and pay cuts of up to 50%. Let's introduce the panel. In Kenya's capital, Nairobi, Rafael Kuchi, special envoy to Africa on aeropolitical affairs at the International Air Transport Association. In San Antonio, Texas, travel and aviation writer, Benet Wilson. And in the Spanish capital, Madrid, Diego Olmedo, a international aviation law expert, as well as an air accident investigator. Welcome to you all. Let's begin in uh, the Spanish capital, Madrid, with Diego Olmedo. Do you think that EasyJet, Ryanair and British Airways have a case that needs to be heard? Can they take the British government to task over this? Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, what it is absolutely clear is that it's absolutely understandable what they are doing because these type of measures that uh, governments across the globe are implementing are very uh, disproportionate. Uh, the effects that these measures are going to have on the industry and on the airline side is, is massive. So it's absolutely normal that they are trying to challenge these type of measures. Um, for example, when you think about the, the different uh, approach that uh, governments are having, uh, comparing, for example, uh, the situation in Italy, or in Spain, where we are supposed to be opening our uh, frontier in the uh, 1st of July, and you compare it to the situation of, of uh, the UK, it's absolutely normal that they try to challenge these decisions. Um, it is very hard to say if they are going to succeed or not. Uh, of course, I'm a, an expert in Spanish law. I, I think that governments have an obligation to look after the public health, so it's uh, understandable that they are making this type of uh, decisions or they're trying to regulate this type of situations. Uh, and at the same time, when you take this uh, type of case to the courts, courts will have to rule on a very specific point which would be uh, uh, allowing to lift the restrictions of mobility of, of passengers 
uh, in the UK, and it's very difficult to see a judge uh, accepting to taking over to take over that uh, responsibility and saying that uh, it is okay to move uh, in the UK or out, you know, out of the UK. So I think that they have uh, a good case, uh, and, and that, but at the same time, it is difficult that they are going to succeed, or at, at least we are in a very early stage to, to be able to, to judge that from my perspective. And I think it'll be the first of many cases. Let's bring in uh, Benet Wilson here, who is in San Antonio, Texas. The American airlines, American, United, etc., have all been under a lot of pressure even before COVID-19 came along. They were complaining about subsidies given by particularly Middle East governments, the Middle Eastern airlines that were unfair competition, to, uh, to use the words, of the White House. Uh, but now with COVID-19, um, is there a way, do you think, that airlines will get together and bring pressure, not just on the US government, but on all governments. Is this what needs to happen now? And are you seeing any signs of that? Well, I think that the airlines are in a difficult position. Uh, on the one hand, uh, they need to fly. You know, our airlines are um, publicly traded, so they rely on their stocks and bonds to keep things afloat. Uh, and they need passengers in those seats. But they also have to balance that with the need to keep those passengers safe. So um, these are things that are colliding. And I think somewhere, some, at some point, something's going to have to give. So I could see airlines trying to bear pressure to just make things a level playing field, to make sure that there are rules and regulations in place that can be followed and that passengers are safe. Well, let's take the African continent's example. We have Raphael Kuchi in Nairobi. Raphael, are we in a position where, and just, just considering the continent at the moment, are we in a position where in about a year's time, we may only see half the airlines that are flying at the moment because of this crisis? Well, that is a, a, pro a probability, uh, considering the fact that up until now, with all the appeals that have gone on from various industry groupings for governments in Africa to support airlines and indeed the aviation industry, very little is forthcoming from governments uh, in, by way of support to the industry. Uh, as we speak now, uh, as you probably are aware, about four airlines have gone into voluntary, either voluntary liquidation, as in the case of Air Mauritius, and, and uh, um, um, receivership uh, as in the case of uh, South African Airways, South African Express, and uh, Kome. Now, so we are going to see most likely many of such instances, unless, of course, governments come to bail out airlines and, and get them back some liquidity to be able to continue their operations. Let me just bring in uh, Diego here in uh, Madrid. Is there any appetite from the governments to bail out the airlines in the way that they need to be bailed out with those huge sums? Yeah, no, there is no initiative on our government, uh, on our government side to, to help them in, in that respect. That has been something that has been suggested by the European Commission when they were making um, the recommendations about the use of vouchers um, uh, to avoid the refund of tickets. But uh, our government has not uh, taken any leadership in that respect, and they are not making any move, at least uh, the, to this moment. Uh, Benet Wilson in San Antonio. There has been a frustration between the airlines and the governments for a very long time. Uh, the governments have suggested that the airlines have simply railroaded them in many cases when it came to subsidies, when it came to uh, landing rights, when it came to the way the airlines were run. Is there any appetite to want to help them now when they are in real trouble? Is it a question of the, you know, almost the boy that cried wolf? Well, um, the U.S. government has helped the airlines. There is $50 billion um, in loans and um, grants given to airlines to help them survive as they've had to ground fleets um, and furlough, voluntary furloughs and um, layoffs of um, of crew workers. So yeah, the money is already there and it's going to last through the end of September. And what happens after that, that's what everyone is watching. But that's really the question, Benet. It's, it's, this, isn't, this is now the new normal. I mean, we're not going to get back to normal. Um, I think it was the, in fact, it was IATA itself that said we probably won't get back to normal until 2023. So sh are we at a point now where we should be thinking 
that this is, the, this is now the new normal, so it's not about bailouts anymore, it's about a restructuring of the entire airline industry. Absolutely. Um, all three airlines, the major airlines here in the United States have said just that. Um, they're going to come out of this and they're going to come out of this smaller. So that's going to lead to fewer jobs in the industry. That's going to mean fewer flights to some of the medium and small cities that are used to getting service now. And we're just going to see a leaner and meaner um, airline industry going forward. It's not going to be like it was at its peak in 2019. Raphael, I, I saw you wanting to respond there. What's your response? Yes, I, I, I think we're going to emerge out of this, this crisis with a, with a much more um, structured airline industry that is more efficient and focus more on profitability and delivering the core mandates that they have. Um, but before we get there, the airline industry, because all operations have literally been grounded, it would be important for governments to at least give the initial injection for these airlines to get out of this crisis first before they can then get themselves restructured and move forward. Diego, are we seeing the end of cheap airlines? Are we seeing the end of low-budget airlines? Are we seeing the end of people getting on a, fr on, a fl on a Friday night because they can, because it was cheap? Is that all over now? Yeah, that's, it's very hard to say, but uh, if you think about how the industry was uh, evolving in the last few years, it's true that uh, we were seeing that many of the major airlines were taking some of the uh, approach that uh, the, the cheap airlines or, or the low-cost airlines were taking. So that uh, barrier between uh, the large or typically all airlines uh, and the, uh, and, and the low-cost airlines was not existing as, uh, as it used to be. Uh, Probably the, the survival of the of the uh, airlines will will need the help from the governments uh, in Spain. We also have some some assistance to to, uh, to the airlines by our government, and that's also happening in other countries uh, of the European Union. And the European Commission has a very important role to play here. Uh, for example, with the case of the vouchers that I was mentioning before, uh, that is a very key uh, key aspect that they need help to survive and. The survival of airlines uh, or not will very much depend on the obligation to reimburse tickets to passengers. If they are forced to reimburse the money to all the passengers, then I'm sure that a lot of airlines will will uh, bankrupt in the, in, the, in the way. But we are now talking about restructuring, and I think all three of you agree that the airlines are going to come out of this in a very different industry than the one we've been uh, used to seeing. But what does restructuring actually look like? Uh, Rafael, I want to begin with you. Are we... I mean, particularly in, a, in, the, in the continent, in Africa, I mean, cargo is very, very important. Uh, is cargo going to become increasingly much more important for commercial airlines who perhaps aren't in that sector right now? Yes, cargo is becoming more and more important. Uh, unfortunately for Africa, many of the airlines are ill-prepared to take advantage of the cargo traffic uh, currently because... In their previous structures, many of them did not uh, did not consider cargo operations as a core and integral part of their business model. So they focused too much on passenger at the expense of cargo. So now that the cargo the passenger business has disappeared and cargo has emerged, they don't they do not have the equipment to be able to support that. So we have, however, seen an, a, a number of airlines quickly convert some of their passenger aircraft into cargo freighters so that they can operate, uh, they, they can take advantage of the cargo business. But going forward, Africa would need a lot more cargo their business because of the pace of development. If you recall, before COVID-19, Africa had some of the fastest developing uh, economies in the world. And infrastructure development and the uh, investment in manufacturing was picking up significantly. Again, also because the African Union is pushing ahead with the African Continental Free Trade Area, which is to facilitate intra-Africa trade among countries, um, cargo, 
capacity would be needed to be able to support uh, the movement of, of goods and services around the continent. Uh, Benet Wilson in San Antonio, how did the American airlines restructure? What does their restructure look like? Is it cargo? Is it something else? Documents, perhaps? I don't know. What do you think it might be? Can they restructure? Well, um, all three of the major carriers have cargo operations um, that's kind of built into what they do. So we're good there. What we're seeing is the grounding of fleets, American Airlines grounding its 757s. Some of these planes are, that are grounded temporarily will come back, but a lot of them won't. Um, we're also seeing routes being restructured. Um, smaller and medium-sized cities um, are either going to see reduced service or they're going to lose their service. Because again, smaller fleets, you're not gonna be able to serve all of the cities that you served before um, COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic hit. So you're, again, you're going to see airlines coming out of this leaner and meaner. Diego, it's an interesting point, isn't it? There's only so much you can restructure. There's only so much use an airline has, cargo people, really. What else can you do? Yeah, it's very difficult. They, they will have to uh, look at different opportunities in the market, maybe um, trying to merge with uh, other uh, type of services, trying to to offer uh, some services like uh, may maybe uh, launching different uh, campaigns to to, uh, to take us as passengers to a specific hotel chains or, or trying to find services outside of the pure scope of the of the transportation. Uh, in order to survive and to, to do these uh, partnerships, uh, which will help them to survive in the, the next uh, one, two, three years. The other big challenge, of course, for the airline industries is, is, is simply right now, is this idea of social distancing. Um, we, I have seen airlines running almost half empty flights because they don't want people sitting next to each other, which is great for passengers. Let's be absolutely honest, that middle seat in economy, a complete nightmare for everybody but it's not profitable for the airlines. Diego, let me begin with you, and I will come to all three of you, but Diego, let me begin with you. How do you deal with that other than by putting up the prices so high that airline, once again, like in the 50s, becomes a luxury? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's going to be implemented. That's a policy that is going to be implemented in Spain. Actually, this week we had a flight um, of between Madrid and Alfarote in the, in the Canary Islands, where one of the passengers was uh, positive in a test, uh, and then they had to, uh, the rest of the passengers had to take the test, and all of them were negative. So this proves that all the allegations of the industry about the the uh, filters of the aircraft uh, are working, that's really uh, uh, true. So this type of cases that I'm sure that we are gonna see more and more often in the future uh, weeks, uh, will help to probably make the regulator understand that uh, it is not needed, the social distancing in the, in the aircraft. Uh, Benet Wilson, is it time for uh, airlines to get back to that 50s way of travel where it was very expensive, where there were fewer people on a flight, where the service was much better, where uh, it was actually an event to go on a flight? Are we heading that way? I hope not. Um, I'm of an age where um, I was I, I flew on the airlines before deregulation. So I actually remember that wonderful service. But I also remember that flying was for the very rich. So normal people like me, I only was able to do it because my father was in the Air Force and they paid for it. But normal people couldn't fly. So I hope that we don't go back down that road. But I do think we're going to start seeing higher prices because all of this is expensive. Social distancing on a plane costs money. Um, cleaning the planes, that costs money. So the money has to come from somewhere and airlines sell tickets. So it's highly likely that the passengers will start to bear the brunt of the costs for keeping um, flights safe and clean. Rafael Cucci in, in Nairobi, I mean, your conversations with your fellow members of IATA, what do you, when you have those conversations and you look to the future, what sort of airline industry are you seeing? Well, what we see is that in the immediate term, we, we're likely to see uh, a patchwork of measures by different governments, some insisting on social distancing on board, others saying that it's not necessary. 
But going forward, we see an industry where um, airlines will be allowed to carry passengers like they used to be before. You can fill all your seats uh, going forward. Um, and that should not be in the, in the long distance future. Uh, this is because we need to keep air transport continuously affordable and, and be able and available and accessible to as many uh, people as would want to use it rather than uh, constrain it by high um, prices and make it a preserve of just a few who can afford. Diego, you've listened to what everybody else has had to say. Um, airline safety is clearly a big part of what, it, what you do. Uh, you're an air crash investigator. We've seen a number of air crashes recently. Uh, is there any way that you can see that COVID-19, the increased safety measures, the increased look at passenger capacity is going to have a positive impact on airline safety? Airline safety is improving year after year. When you look at the numbers, and Ayata published the report of last year, just a few weeks ago, uh, you realize that uh, the, the level of safety and security that we are reaching is incredible. Um, I, I do think that uh, the COVID-19 is going to help us to improve this, this safety in terms of the spread of diseases on board. The spread of diseases was already happening uh, uh, before the outbreak of this virus, although it was not as as serious as now because the the um, infections were uh, fewer, obviously. But I do think that the measures that uh, airlines, uh, air, uh, airport operators and, and other members of the industry are going to have to implement will help us to improve the safety in, the, in, in, in that sense in the, in the industry. Yes. Uh, Rafael, what do you think? Do you think uh, that there are any positives coming out of COVID-19 and the crisis the airlines are facing? Um, I'm afraid uh, not, not, not so much uh, good news coming out um, for now, but we, we do hope that um, as we move uh, forward um, in, into uh, towards the end of the year and into 2021, we, we expect to see uh, much more uh, positive news. And uh, as far as safety is concerned, the industry itself has uh, introduced uh, the IATA, led by IATA, introduced the IATA Operational Safety Audit, which has made it mandatory for all IATA member airlines to be IOSA registered. Uh, and this has significantly assisted, among other measures, to improve safety across um, the, the, the world. And in particular, in Africa, uh, safety used to be a problem some 10 years back. But now we are seeing significant improvements um, in safety across Africa. And we do not hope that will relapse, uh, even though uh, we know that airlines are having uh, uh, financial difficulties at this point in time. We are very confident that they will keep their focus on the safety measures because no airline, which is IOSA registered, would want to lose their IOSA status because it has implications for partnership with other airlines and also with uh, other commercial opportunities that you can get. Bene Wilson, we are running out of time, but just quickly, are there any positives coming out of the COVID-19 crisis for the airlines? Um, I think it's going to be a tough few years for the airlines, um, but they're going to recover. They're just not ever going to look like they did before 2019. Thank you very much to all our guests. I'm really hoping that the middle economy seat will disappear as a result of all of this. Let's see. Uh, to Rafael Cucci, Benet Wilson and Diego Almeida, thank you. Thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. For me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here, bye for now.